and welcome to another Lewis for Community TV video. We are here for episode 18 in Tertulia. A bookshop like no other. And it's October, the sun is shining, it's a gorgeous weekend, so we're delighted to be here with you. We are in level three lockdown, so it's not fantastic for everyone, but we're still open and we're delighted to be open. So, and we're reading books, of course, this week, and we had some visitors this week. So who have we had in this week, Neil? Sean Vysak, um, his new book. Wild Nathan, yeah, I think we've been waiting on it for a while. Sean is writing, is, is writing about the wilderness of Nathan and we're dying to get stuck into that ourselves. That's our copy for reading. And? Kevin Toulis, who lives in Ackle Island, Nine Rules to Conquer Death. We only just got it in, so I haven't read yet, but it does seem amazing. It's about, about life and death and how the two, two are as much part of each other as more more so than we realise, so that's one to watch out for. And you've also been reading yourself? I'm back into history. Um, this is uh, Ravina. Um, it's about how a small town in Italy became the, the centre of the Holy Roman Empire in the in the first century uh, AD. And uh, it's a bit of a, a, bit of a fantastic a book. Bit of a monster, a bit yeah. Of a monster. I love it, you love it. And he's adding it to his pile of many books to read. Many, many books to read. <laughs> So yeah, speaking of history, we had Anne Chambers came in to visit us during the summer and she she signed many of her books and you know she writes about history and the most famous one being Grania Whale is one of our top top selling books in the shop. People are still fascinated with the Grania Whale story. So it's lovely when authors come in and it was lovely to meet Anne. So we go over to Anne signing her books and just telling us a little bit about what she's up to at the moment. And, to, to cheer you. and you're here for the O'Malley clan virtual rally and you're signing um, the newer version of the Grace O'Malley biography which I read myself and is fantastic and they're, so they're doing a virtual rally because you couldn't kind of well obviously you couldn't connect people with Covid. No unfortunately the O'Malley's now worldwide couldn't come for the yeah. annual rally this year so what they decided to do was to do a virtual like us all they're zooming and doing that so I was giving a chat to camera down in Rockfleet in Carrigahalli oh, yes, where yes. Grey Somali's last known address so we were talking about the great pirate queen down there and her impact and indeed her relevance for today and I think that's what the my latest version of the book tries to bring out the relevance of yes. Grey Somali today and particularly to women today you know she's an inspirational beacon I think to all of us and you know you have to say that she lived and operated in very difficult times you know there wasn't all sunshine and light in the 16th uh, no. century just like it isn't today so I think we have a lot to learn from her still I'm still learning all the time and it's been a great voyage with her and uh, it looks like it's not going to end for no, a while. No it's not look we've plenty there for you to sign and your other one's the great Leviathan. Yes which, which and that's interesting sense. because that is Grace O'Malley's eighth great grandson in descent mm. and now because of this huge worldwide focus on the anti-slavery and the anti-racism this man played a, a, a remarkable role in the freeing of slaves in the West Indies. Long before anyone got talking about it, he broke all the taboos relating to his own background, uh, to his own finance, to free slaves. And he is up there with all the great leaders of the emancipation movement. But sadly, here in Ireland, we tend to ignore him. So I wrote his biography. Mm. It took me eight years to write. 15,000 letters that he wrote and left wow. behind. His handwriting worse than my own. So I tell you, it was a, a, a real labour, that book. Yeah, and well worth checking out. I think so. Well it's well worth, worth it. Yes. yes. And we have oh, some of the ones we have for the cause is another one. We stop in the shop. Yes, this is uh, my, my own family background because of all the anniversaries that are coming up for the War of Independence and the Civil War and everything like that. It was my, uh, I wanted to show one family uh, in among the bigger national cause. So it's the story of a family from Castlebar and their fight, uh, their struggle really, in the cause of Irish independence. And also, you you know, we, we learned a lot from them because we were always told to learn from history but not try and relive it. And I think yes. that is the that is what they taught us and I hope we, we kind of conformed to that. 
We're still working on it, that's for sure. Yeah, that's we we are. sure are. We so you're going to sign the copies I of everything? I certainly will, I'd be and delighted. Thanks for coming yeah. in. Really it's nice always a pleasure again. to come to this wonderful bookshop. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Thanks, Anne. It's going really well. Fantastic. Thank you. And what have I been reading this week? So I'm just finishing off A Ghost in the Throat by Doreen Igrifa. It's Tramp Press. It's yeah, it's a very different book and I'm going to be reviewing it for the Mayo News. It's written in a female voice. It's a prose style and it connects with a poem on Queen Eib, which was written in the 1700s by a lady, Eileen Weatherglean Dove, who was related to Daniel O'Connell. So, um, yeah, I'm nearly finished it and yeah, I'm, I'm dying to write about it. That's, that's to summarise it and review it. And alongside this, I'm also going to review Savage Her Reply by Deirdre Sullivan, a renowned um, writer of young adult fiction. This, I loved when, when it came out, the idea of it, because it's the voice of the of the character, of the, the lady, the woman, Aoife, who gave vengeance, who took vengeance on the children of Lear. So it's an alternative, the alternative story of that. And it gives voice to her, and I suppose what, what, what happened with the children of Lear. So those two, I'm reviewing for the Mayo News and yeah, I, I love the two together. I've also started and I was looking for something completely different then away from the Irishness. This is about Iran. It's the Enlightenment of the Green Gate Tree. It's been nominated for the Booker Prize and it's really nice to get an opportunity to read some of those nominations. They don't they don't suit everyone. Some some people like those nominations, but this year's been fascinating because all of the writers are mostly um are, are mostly you know foreign like Iranian for example although there's a Scottish a Scottish guy too so I, I'm looking forward to starting that that's, that's the enlightenment of the green gauge tree that's next on my list and then going back to an Irish author and another Irish female author we had Keelan News in the shop with us and we arranged to do an interview on zoom with her about her latest, latest book The Wild Laughter Neil met her I wasn't here that yes, day she's lovely so, and, and, her partner. and her partner also oh. has a book, The Best of Times, The Best and the Worst of Times, about climate change, which we have also mentioned on Tuesday TV another time. So we go over to Keelan, who's going to tell us some more about herself and her book, The Wild After. Okay. Hi, Keelan, or Keelan, isn't it really? <laughs> Welcome, yeah, yeah. Julia. You've been here, I know, in the shop with Neil during the summer now. I didn't get to meet you, unfortunately, but it's so nice that you came in and signed some of your books. Um, which I have copies of here. <laughs> Whoever's listening, get in there and take them off their hands. <laughs> <laughs> um, so today we're we're going to talk about the Wild Laughter, your latest book or your second second novel. Um, absolutely gorgeous book too. The um, I love the the style and and the way they produced it. It's gorgeous. Um, so Kaylin, you you yes, I suppose we'll talk about this today. I mean, the, I'm just going to read maybe the first bit. I loved the first part of it if I just read the first paragraph of the first part the night the chief died I lost my father and the country lost a battle it wouldn't confess to be fighting for the no collared laboring class for the decent dependable patriarch for the right of entry from the field into the garden so instantly you're like wow oh my god so maybe just talk to us a bit about that theme why you chose I mean I suppose you have to go back so the main characters chief is the dad and then the two sons heart and uh, Cormac and the mum Nora. So Hart is the narrator. So he's he's telling the story, which I was fascinated by. But why you chose this subject? You know, at that time in Ireland, that difficult time that we went through. What? Why was that the the subject for this book? And um, do you mean the financial crash? Yeah, and why you, you centered, I suppose, the whole family dynamic and everything that was happening around that time, and and what was happening with the chief and his investments and what went wrong and how that how that kind of played itself out yeah um I suppose I'm I'm always just writing realism and um I uh 
I was I like to write about the re recent history. I'm not I don't I don't see myself writing historical fiction, although I suppose never say never. But um, and I was writing about characters who were, you know, growing up in a similar period and were who would have been entering the kind of professional field in a similar period to when I did. And so it just was it wasn't really a choice to kind of write about, you know, um, a downward mobility. Um, but I think it's very hard to write about contemporary Ireland without having some kind of awareness of that um, and kind of uh, yeah I mean in any case so social mobility has been changing so much over the last 20 years you know I think for my parents generation there would have been an expectation that you know your children will do will do better than you will um, and now that's no longer the case so I think um, intergenerationally and everything there, those tensions are there and those kind of disappointments or those frustrations or those, you know, that, that pain um, intergenerationally. Um, and uh, so I, I, it wasn't so much a decision to write about that kind of as a topic, but I was, I, um, I wanted to write kind of, um, yeah, about contemporary Ireland and, um, I wanted to write about um, a, a family who had been kind of working reasonably straightforward or making a kind of straightforward living um, uh, on a farm. And um, nonetheless, you know, um, no, no matter how many hours they work a day, they kind of can't um, make ends meet. Um, and so um, that's the kind of tragedy there. I knew also it was kind of a love story. And so what, you know, what the sons can do for their father and, and what the father feels he needs to do um, and what he should have done for his sons. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. It does, no, it does. And yeah, because it's, it's the setting, isn't it? You've set, you've set, you've chosen that context to tell your story. And yeah, I thought it was interesting as well how, you know, it's told through heart. And I was fascinated by, you know, how, how easy or, or difficult it is to write a story, you know, as a man, you, you, you're, you know, to write a man's story. I was fascinated why you chose that too. It could have been two daughters, couldn't it? But you chose two sons. Yeah. Yeah, it could have. Although when I thought about the novel, uh, you know, as I was writing it and afterwards, um, there was no way that I could have changed any of the characters' genders. It would have just had too many implications, which is to say, I suppose, the idea of growing up um, male in a kind of rural environment on a farm has its impact. Like it isn't, you know, um, if you were a female in the same situation, the implications on your kind of self um, um, I, you know, on your identity and on how other people treat you and how, all of that would be different. So it would end up being a kind of different story. Um, but I was also interested in writing about, you know, cowardice and bravery. And, um, and, and as soon as you have bravery, you know, you have a, um, a definition of bravery. And, and so then I became kind of interested in that, you know, and, um, and, and, it's interesting, it was interesting to me to have a male character kind of describe himself or kind of victimize himself in a way through this narrative um, um, where we could kind of still love him as readers, but be become maybe critical of his um, self-perception or, um, you know, his actions, the actions that he's able to take or the actions that he's only really taking in his, um, in his kind of thoughts and, uh, um, and in his conversation. Um, I was interested in the idea of having these, you know, th these three central male characters who all together have the attributes of a hero you know, like of a kind of demigod hero, you know, um, there's even a connection to the gods, there's this unshakable bravery, um, there's combat prowess, <laughs> you think of a Cormac, there's a tragic death, um, you know, um, and an honour, and so all of those together kind of are the attributes of a hero, but, but, to, but separately, the men are not heroic, um, and uh, I, 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 it felt, it just felt interesting for me to explore that. And it felt um, like if I were exploring it um, through a female character, it would end up a very different story. My first novel was a, had a female um, lead. It wasn't the first novel I wrote. I had to kind of practice on a few uh, male characters first because I knew as soon as I wrote a female lead, I would bring so much extra to it. Um, uh, it's baggage and all the rest, <laughs> and you know, my own neuroses. So in a way, um, the simplicity of the story of the wild laughter um, benefited for in my own writing from it being a male character. 
Yeah, it did. I get that now that you're saying it. Yeah. And I get that what you were saying about the three of them together make up that character. Yeah. Fascinating. And I suppose also your your humor and 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 the way that you write. I know I, I listened to the interview you did with Sebastian Barry and or with Kevin Barry, and you were saying, oh, you know, you're not very funny, whatever. But the book is, I mean, obviously it's called The Wild Laughter and it centers around, you know, humor and 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 how we might use that in life. But I suppose how it's I mean, I do write a little bit and writing humor is very difficult, but somehow you you do that in the book. And it is black at times. It is, isn't it? I'm not just thinking it's me, but there is that kind of black side to to humor in situations that are not really supposed to be funny but somehow you, you do that in the book and i suppose is that just the way that you are all the time or <laughs> no no um i i mean i i love writing fiction as much as right now i mean i'm at the start of a, another novel and it's you know it's just excruciating <laughs> and this i'm i'm a very slow writer and it takes me a really long time to nail the characters I'm, it's always very character led and so um the if if i end up writing funny characters it's so sustaining for me as kind of a, um in the writing and i also love reading books that are funny um uh, you know, a lot of my favorite writers, you know, they will, they will make you laugh no matter how kind of tragic or epic, you know, they, they are. Um, and um, yeah, the, the, the other thing is like, I, I tried, I tried as an exercise once I was teaching at Maastricht University and I had these, <clears throat> I had these students and I was telling them that the best way to improve is to kind of keep failing, you know, to keep making stuff. And then I thought, well, this isn't going to sink in unless I demonstrate, <laughs> you know, that it's all well and good to say something, but I actually need to show them. So I decided that I would share with them my, um, uh, my whole trajectory of trying to get a piece of comedy writing published. And the reason for this was because there was this um, website that gives you a kind of a response in three days to any piece of comedy writing. So I thought, okay, our semester is this long. I, I'm going to, this is going to, this is not my forte at all writing like not fiction but straight comedy so I'm going to be coming from a similar position as a student in inexperienced possibly you know <laughs> it's not the right form for me and then um, I went through the process and I started writing these pieces and every week I would show them the rejection slips um, <laughs> and uh, I think I wrote 28 pieces ever, taking the train back and forth to and I, I never got one published <laughs> which is to say that like you know, for me, the uh, it's it's very much married with fiction. And um, why, you know, if I'm able to write, you know, humorously at all, it's through the other characters that I'm um, kind of interacting with, and through their imaginations, and through meeting them. And that's partly the joy of writing. It's also, I think, the joy of life. You know, um, and at least for me, it's kind of very high up there in the priorities lists. Um, and but I couldn't do it when I was trying to, you know, I mean, when I was trying to write comedy, I really couldn't. It wasn't kind of coming off. And so I, I need the I need the barrier of other characters. <laughs> yeah. And it just it just come through definitely in the book because you're it's on, well, it is almost like your thought process. We can see it as, as you're doing it. So, yes. I mean, and in life, that's what we do. Like you say, that is is how we are. And we do look at things funny in life. So that's why the book is so real. Yeah. And as you said, that that's what you like. And I suppose finally, just the style that you've written it, the way, you know, it, it, it's in short paragraphs or why you chose that, you know, like the first one is only half a page and it's, so it's numbered paragraphs, like a, a prose style. Why, why do you write in that? Not, I suppose, more traditional fiction writing. For, yeah, for me, every book um, has, it comes with it with its own demands almost. And you're my job uh, in the beginning of the writing why I write so, so slowly to begin with is to be a, become attuned to that. Um, it's been different for uh, really everything I've written, even the short stories that I've written. I wrote three novels before I ever wrote a short story and uh, <laughs> that wasn't a good idea. Like um, it, you definitely are wiser to, you know, go through the process of writing stories first. You'll just learn so much and, and also you'll complete things and there won't be this burden of, um, of how many, oh my God, how many years to go. Um, but uh, yeah, um, I, even story to story, like how I'll, how I'll lay down a paragraph, the kind of voice, the length of sentences, um, you know, even how you move people through a room, all of that seems to be so far unique to each piece of writing. 
so and, and it's it's weird um how you figure that out it's kind of it's hard it would be very hard to explain except that when you put something down on the page it doesn't feel right you know and it just it doesn't there's something not right um and uh, I, so i i remember discovering that when I was writing The Wild Laughter and I thought like why am I doing it like a stanza break like in a poem there's a gap between each paragraph you know and um uh and I just thought that uh, maybe I'll fix this afterwards and I'll change it you know but just for now um and and then it turned out that that kind of in, in the end was the form that the novel wanted to take I suppose it's quite compressed it's quite dense you know it had been a lot longer it's had a long lifespan the novel um, it took seven years really to get it to the um, form that it's in and so in th through that process it's kind of been concertina a bit um, and so the, um, the these kind of short um, compact paragraphs um, and chapters are a result of that as well. Yeah god seven years wow Caitlin <laughs> that's um, perseverance and it does you're you're right it is compressed and it does it does show in the book it's it's so beautifully crafted so thank you so much Caitlin um, oh, and that's your gorgeous book which we do have for sale in the shop so thank you so much to you both <laughs> yeah and good luck with the next book we look forward to uh to hearing and hearing some more about it thank you yeah hopefully the characters are are are, are funnier funnier still so that I can have a, some joy in the writing <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they will be thanks Caitlin thank bye you. bye yeah, that's really lovely and uh, it's great to meet you and Paul and um yeah, to, to hear about the book and yeah, and why you write, which was really interesting. Yeah. And that's it, really. That's it for today. So thanks to Keelan and to um, um, Anne and to Kevin and John who popped into the shop and to all our customers and everyone who, who comes through our shop. It's a joy as usual. So we will say goodnight and goodbye. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.